This is Pastor Steve with an Easter Vigil edition for the Daily Holy Week Meditations. I pray you and your loved ones are all well as we practice safe distance during this COVID-19 pandemic, and that you had a wonderful Good Friday. By the way, even though the German for Good Friday bears another name, namely Karfreitag, or Sorrowful Friday, Martin Luther also called it, like we, Gute Freitag, or Good Friday. Be that as it may, during Holy Week we walk with Jesus to the cross, his death, burial, and on Easter the joy of resurrection. The meditations in this series are based on works by the German sculptor and woodcarver Tilman Riemenschneider, and I combine Holy Scripture with writings by the late German pastor and martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was killed on the 9th of April, 1945. The 9th of April is acknowledged in our Evangelical Lutheran Church in America as his commemoration day. Riemenschneider was a master in the aesthetic of natural wood carving. He purposely left his subjects unpainted and he imbued each subject with a fine, lifelike detail. Today, we leave our reflections on the magnificent Holy Blood Altar that was carved for St. James Church in the city of Rotenburg ob der Taube, and we go to a less ostentatious altar in a small village at the edge of Rotenburg called Detvang. This simpler, more modest Holy Cross altar, as it has come to be known, was originally made for the chapel of St. Michael in Rotenburg ob der Tauber. It depicts the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. The altar was found in pieces in 1653 and put together for St. Peter Church in Detvang in Taubertal near Rotenburg. We focus today on the scene of the crucifixion depicted in the middle panel of the altar. There we see the women with Mary, Jesus' mother, in the front with her arms crossed, holding a cloth. Is it part of her veil or a covering for her son? The disciple whom he loved, as the Gospel of John names him, or as tradition has it, the actual disciple, John, is standing immediately behind her with a supporting arm at Mary's waist. To the right of Jesus are men. Are they the soldiers sent to watch over the crucified ones? Or the centurion who first proclaimed, truly, this was the Son of God? Or is it Joseph of Arimathea with Nicodemus come to retrieve Jesus' body? Perhaps they are all represented here, and we are to remember all the various witnesses present at the crucifixion. From John chapter 19, we hear the passion narrative and hear the characters named in the narrative. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity, 
So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jewish leadership, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. While in prison, Bonhoeffer wrote to his close friend, Eberhard Bethege, the following. Everything we may with some good reason expect or beg of God is to be found in Jesus Christ. What we imagine a God could and should do, the God of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with all that. We must immerse ourselves again and again for a long time and quite calmly in Jesus' life, his sayings, actions, suffering, and dying in order to recognize what God promises and fulfills. What is certain is that we may always live aware that God is near and present with us, and that this life is an utterly new life for us, that there is nothing that is impossible for us anymore because there is nothing that is impossible for God, that no earthly power can touch us without God's will, and that danger and urgent need can only drive us closer to God. What is certain is that we have no claim on anything, but may ask for everything. What is certain is that in suffering lies hidden the source of our joy, in dying the source of our life. What is certain is that in all this we stand within a community that carries us. To all this, God has said yes and amen in Jesus. This yes and amen is the solid ground upon which we stand. Again and again in these turbulent times, we lose sight of why life is really worth living. We think that our own life has meaning because this or that other person exists. In truth, however, it is like this. If the earth was deemed worthy to bear the human being, Jesus Christ, if a human being like Jesus lived, then and only then does our life as human beings have meaning. Had Jesus not lived, then our life would be meaningless, despite all the other people we know, respect, and love. These are good words for us to hear in our own turbulent times when we face this pandemic, COVID-19, a new virus, and are uncertain and perhaps filled with anxiety. These are good words that 
God has given his yes to us. In the second chapter, or in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, rather, the Apostle Paul writes, For in Jesus Christ, every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason, it is through him that we say the Amen to the glory of God. We pray today with words by Matthias Gotthard Niethart called Grunewald. He was a contemporary of Riemann Schneider and a major figure in a generation of great northern German Renaissance painters that also included the likes of Albrecht Dürer, Lukas Cranach, and Albrecht Altdorfer. We pray with him. Jesus, my dear Jesus, I pray that you use me as a wick for a lamp in which you give your oil. Depart not from me, lest my life dry like the grass, but let your image be in me. Kindle your light and let me be as a holy fire on the edge of a dark wilderness, so that those who dwell in the darkness might know how to find you. From you comes what is good in me. From me comes only what is small and weak. Lord, have mercy on me. Amen. Let us close again with this wonderful arrangement from David Drury of Be Thou My Vision. Thank you.